Hey everyone, hello, welcome back. It's been a while. I was on vacation and that's why I couldn't make such a big number of videos in the past. Uh, from now on, I'll try to make them more. Uh, I also have to express uh, a slight disappointment because no more such a, a big number of donations from you. And if you guys want to support a guy who just helps me to do this, uh, from another point of view, uh, if you really want to keep up with the good content and to have like good analysis, some refreshing lines, forgotten lines, uh, you have to actually, uh, we need help. Uh, thank you so much for that. I appreciate that very much and tonight I'm very excited because I found one uh, kind of forgotten uh, but very interesting line. It's called Belgrade Gambit. As you know, I'm from Serbia and uh, Serbia's capital is Belgrade. Belgrade Gambit in the past was played like by GMs like uh, ex-world champion Mihal Tal and you know him. He was like a crazy guy with so many, I mean, crazy in the most positive way in terms of uh, coming up with sacrifices and all those stuff. Then uh, from youngsters um, in the past, in early 90s, Swidler was the one who used to play that and Bellon Lopez from Spain, a guy whose style I really like a lot because he keeps sacrificing pieces all the time and makes some good chess. Uh, finally, there is a GM from France, Priya, who uh, does this gambit with the white pieces occasionally. Anyways, how do we reach this opening? It's e4, e5, knight f3, most logical move, knight c6, knight c3, and at the moment we have four knights. Here, four knights classic variation would be bishop e5, then you have kind of four knight scotch approach with d4, and it looks like Probably most of you, speaking of uh, you guys on lower levels, play like this and captured by knight on d4, but surprisingly, you play knight to d5. This is Belgrade Gambit. So, uh, let's go with it. Knight d5's idea, first of all, nowadays, I have to say that it's not even a bad opening. Um, Certainly, I'm not trying to persuade you to say, play this opening, it's perfect, you're going to be able to beat up everybody with it. No, I'm just trying to come up with something really uh, interesting, kind of uh, refreshing for your opening repertoire, and basically uh, some something that you might like to play and to have fun in your Blitz Rapid games on lower levels, even in tournament chess. So, what's the point after 95? After knight d5, probably the worst <clears throat> move could be knight takes d5. You take, and now they have two moves. Bishop has to give check on b4, that's the only theoretical move. And what happens if they play like the most logical knight before, threatening pawn on d5? You play bishop c4, you defend pawn, and you want to make sure castle. When they go queen e7, uh, you play king f1. Even king d2, uh, followed by rook e1, is... Uh, worth of considering in some of these lines. But king f1 is absolutely the best. You threaten a3. When they play queen c5, you play uh, queen e2 check, defending bishop on c4, uh, checking this king. And after bishop e7, you play a great tactical uh, move 94. That's why I'm telling you uh, it's kind of forgotten line. Nobody anymore even studies these variations so seriously from Black's point of view. Nobody plays this and it could be always uh, something you can pull up, you know, uh, and you know, in some of your tournaments, in some of your games, in some moments to surprise uh, some of your uh, real chess enemies. And after knight d4, uh, they have to play uh, queen takes d4. Uh, if they play knight d5, you just play knight f5, threatening on f5, threatening on e7, they just fall apart. If they play castles, you play c3, knight d5, you take on d5, and they can't capture on d5 because they lose a bishop. Uh, practically, they have to take on d4. You play bishop g5, you threaten mate in one. Uh, now they have to play f6, uh, because in case of queen c5, you have rook e1. Rook e1 threatens bishop. When they play f6, 
you play bishop e3, and here we have an old tactical idea called deflection. Bishop f4. They, of course, can't take because of checkmate, and just because of that, they have to uh, put the queen on c5, and you go with c3. c3 is an important moment, because knight goes on a6, and when knight goes on a6, you play d6. There is now disconnection between queen and bishop, and mate is inevitable or uh, they're just about to lose some serial and to suffer some uh, serial material consequences. After bishop g5, f6, rook e1, queen c5, bishop e3, queen d6, bishop f4, queen c5, c3, and this d6. Always keep in mind this kind of trick. Same thing happens if f6, rook e1, queen c5, and I already showed you. Um, all things considered, uh, this line with the knight, knight takes d5, and knight before is not good after bishop c4. I just faced once d6, uh, where my opponent tried to, you know, open up this bishop, but he kind of forgot about this knight. So c3, at the moment they can't take on c3 because queen a4 and knight is fallen, so they have to play knight a6, and you go with queen d4. Absolutely paralyzed game by black. A uh, knight on the rim of the board, talking about knight on a6. Uh, inability to develop dark square bishop on e7. Uh, they have problems with the g7 pawn. If they play king, queen e7, feel free to do king d1, followed by rook e1. Uh, they have to play f6, and you know, if somebody has to play like this, uh, it's more than sad position for black. Uh, bad knight on a6. Uh, bad light squares, terrible dark square bishop that is absolutely without any activity on e7. Uh, basically, this is almost winning. All things considered, knight before is bad. Uh, knight, sorry, knight d5 and knight before is bad. Uh, but if they play knight d5, knight d5 and bishop before, uh, of course, queen e7, nothing. You just play bishop e2, knight d5, castles. You don't threaten knight e5, rook e1. When they play knight f3, you just capture by bishop and threaten rook e1. I played a game like this once, once again, and I played some rook e4. Very nice uh, tactical opportunity for white. You know, want to get the pawn back, but you also want to triple your heavy pieces after queen e2, rook e1. You also want to play some queen f4, um, an ideal game. If they try to stop bishop f4, queen e2, bishop d2, rook e1, it's almost... Uh, winning for white. And they have to play bishop before. Uh, speaking with some guys, they told me bishop before is considered to be so good ag uh, against this gambit. I don't believe so. After I analyze this, after bishop d2, when they go bishop d2, go queen d2, knight is hanging, knight is seven, and now you have this uh, very nice a resource for white. It's d6. All of a sudden, we created like triple pawns. At a moment where two pawns down, but don't even worry about this, we're gonna uh, take on d4 by knight, place bishop on e2 and f3, put the rook from h1 and, uh, you know, like solidify that rook and play on the uh, place on the open e file, and of course, just in uh, case of, you know, like safety, put the king on b1. Uh, great position for white, and white is certainly better. After bishop d2, I realized that in uh, practice, lots of guys went for queen e7. Queen e2, bishop d2, king d2, queen e1, and now one, uh, one might say, but this is now dry, it's uh, almost endgame. It's terrible position for them. Knight before, bishop c4. We're about to get the pawn back, and it's not only that. When they play castle, and finally, they can say, okay, at the moment we're even pawn up, while they waste their time to get a pawn back, we will just reorganize our pieces with the d6, bishop, d7, rook. No, it's not going to happen. You play a3, put the knight once again on the edge of the board, and you play rook h3, one. I want to get a pawn back on d4. I want to play b4 to limit this knight. And finally, rook on e1 controls e file, and I can always... Uh, go and put it after you play d6 on e7. White is great. Uh, after knight d5, uh, in past, in that romantic era when Belgrade Gambit actually showed up, most of guys used to take on e4. Very risky decision by black. Queen e2, f5. I found some articles and books where the guys said, this is considered to be good for black. 
and one of the main lines and main approaches in the past was knight g5 and then black goes with d3 knight e4 and this really looks fine in practice for black uh, i just have to tell you it's not like that bad for white either uh, but black has better chances definitely although after knight e4 queen e2 and f5 i found this move uh, played by grandmaster belen lopez from spain uh, it's very nice one bishop f4 uh, threatening knight on a uh, threatening pawn on c7 uh, computer says d bishop d6 but i don't want to analyze bishop d6 because it doesn't look like a human move uh, i'm just going to briefly show you what happens there you take you once again create triple pawns uh, which is a terrible thing in black's position you go for long castles and when they play short castle, you take on d4, which is great for you. Computer once again says, this must be great for black after queen a5, because threatened both. Pawn on uh, a2 and knight on d5, you play c4. And when they take uh, on a2, you just play knight to d4. Uh, after castles, knight f5. Uh, a deeper analysis on this variation would show you that with a brilliant knowledge by black, they can equalize. So, once again, nothing to be uh, afraid of and nothing to escape there once again. Uh, after bishop f4, just like I told you, absolutely the most normal move is d6. Of course, you play long castles. And here I have to show you some stuff. Uh, critical position. Critical position and might happen to you in many games. You're down two pawns at the moment. d4 pawn is about to fall, so you're going to end up uh, being down a pawn. Uh, in theory, uh, engines, books, articles, everybody suggests this knight e7. Let's take a look what happens when they play, uh, when they simply try to retain some material um, advantage. So, what happens if they play bishop e7? They simply want to make castle. Yes. They play knight e4, knight e4, rook d4, castles, queen c4, you now threaten. Uh, open check, king is kind of weak, and after bishop e6, you play queen c7. It's nice, uh, because when they take on, they can't take on c7, knight c7, and rook and bishop would be hanging. After bishop d5, you take on d8, take on d5, and you have bishop pair. So when they take on f2, you play rook g1. Uh, practically great position for white. Bishop pair on the board, that's one thing. Second thing, uh, such a big number of weaknesses, speaking of pawn weakness on d6, kind of weak king, uh, weak light squares in black's game. All these things uh, definitely uh, force us to think that white is better. And when the, you play long castle, they go bishop e6. Uh, I've seen so many games of mine, bishop f6, and you play queen c4. Now you threaten nice... Uh, tactics, knight c7 followed by queen e6, king f7, oops, sorry, king f7, that happened to me, like, bishop is defended, my game is good, and look what I did in most of these games, knight d4, at the moment, I'm threatening rook takes e4, followed by knight g5, so they can't take on d4, because we take on d4, now we're about to take on e6, King is kind of weak if you remove the light square bishop. And that's what I like about Belgrade Gambit. So many tactical opportunities. And guys, once again, I insist. I don't claim that this Gambit is like the best in the world. Or uh, it's uh, there, there are no lines that are good for black. But basically, uh, if uh, we simply take this variation as kind of forgotten and that nobody plays it, uh, lately, then it's very, very interesting for you to use it in the future. Uh, apart from that, uh, bishop e6, they also can go with knight to e5. After knight to e5, you get a first pawn back, rook d4. Uh, for example, now we want to take on uh, e5 and get a second pawn back with way better activity. Uh, let me just show you what happens if they play knight g6, if they just move this knight towards the you know, the king's side, around the king, threatening this bishop, you just play knight d2. Uh, king is exposed on e8, knight on e4 is gonna fall, we even threaten f3, uh, completely lost for black. Uh, what happens if they play bishop e6? You give check, they go c6, you take on b7, and when they play bishop d5, 
You have once again beautiful tactical move, rook takes d5. They can take on d5 because you take by knight and they can't stop bishop if I would check. Great opening so far, lots of tactical opportunities and based on a pretty good analysis and perhaps by white, this could be very dangerous weapon in the hands of a good tactical player. Uh, I'll show you one game. Game was played between uh, the GM uh, Belon Lopez and one more guy. Uh, it was c6. I believe that another guy was an IMR GM. Uh, he took on e5. And this is interesting. If they have to take on e5. If they play c takes d5, you play queen h5, g6, knight, uh, bishop b5, king e7 check. Queen goes back on h5 to threaten mate. D takes e5. And now look at this mess on the board. You believe it or not, take on e4 and they can't stop. Uh, G, uh, bishop g5 losing the queen. When they take bishop, you give check, and here you have the final touch, rook d5, so they can't take by king because you'll play rook to d1 and take the queen on d8. Once again, beautiful tactical opportunities. That's why they take on e5, but that doesn't save their game either. We take on e4, and uh, it's interesting, the guy played bishop d6, uh, if f takes, check this, check, and we're about to see this point. Uh, and just when you think that, oh, we're going to win the rook, and when they play king f7, boom, knight c7, you threaten rook, another one is threatened, but most importantly, you threaten bishop c4 with mate because king on f7 is kind of jeopardized. So after... A rook e4, when they play bishop d6, look at the game. The guy played rook e5, another uh, great rook sack, king f7, and play the move of the game. I'll stop the video, and this is advanced tactics. This is advanced tactics, so this is uh, more for like uh, 1800 guys and higher than that. So you go with knight c7. Knight c7, such a beautiful move. Once again, you threaten rook, but mainly you threaten queen h5, followed by bishop c4. Uh, after queen c7, queen h5, bishop c4, and checkmate uh, was inevitable. Beautiful game. Uh, so far, I showed you like two moves. I showed you like how to play against um, a variation with... Uh, when they take on d5, how do you play when they take on e4? I just want to show you the best line according to computers and analysis in some magazines and articles. It's d6 castles and bishop knight e7. Once again, it's not the end of the world. You just take on e7, bishop e7, knight e4, castles, and now when they finally want to uh, simply um, get the game easier and simplify the game because they're up upon, you play h4. They can't take on h4, of course, because you have queen h5 and then you either win the bishop or pawn on h7. That's a common uh, tactical trick or a trick just to <clears throat> oppose bishop g5 idea. So when you play h4, they go king h8, and here you kick the knight away and play king to b1. Uh, I analyze this position. Once again, I have to say you just play queen c2. It's not the end of the world. I mean, it can be played for white, Definitely, uh, black should be slightly better, uh, but I don't think this is one of those positions where you just have to say, oh, just because of this game, I don't want to play this line. Uh, there are si simply uh, still tactical possibilities in white's position, and I kind of I uh, suggest if this is one of the highest risks about this opening that you got to take, let it be. Let's go all in. And after knight d5, uh, by the way, lots of my students told me, Maya, they usually play d6. They don't want to accept the game. Then you just take on d4 and feel free to play a little bit better game. Keep in mind, you now threaten very nasty knight b5 uh, move. Uh, if they go h6, uh, like we want to avoid knight g5, bishop g5, then you play bishop f4, once again threaten on c7 d6 and you take on d4 and once again you're easily better because they spend time on kind of passive moves like h6 and d6. Uh, one of my students asked me 
uh, I checked one article in one magazine. They say that the night before is refutation. I said, no big deal. I take on d4. And when you take the pawn, I play queen f3. Once again, I don't claim that in this position, black is not better because up a pawn, but we've got a compensation. We've got a better queen, a better activity of pieces. I want to play bishop d3, move my light square bishop, uh, do castle, either a long or a short castle. I have a nice development advantage at least. I like white's position again. And finally, if they play against knight d5, uh, a line uh, that is simply considered to be absolutely the best for black, it's bishop e7. Once again, we shouldn't panic. Once again, we shouldn't fall uh, into like a great dose of disappointment. Nothing that special. You play bishop before. I uh, usually uh, take this course of these moves with the bishop f4, threatening pawn on c7. Uh, they have to play d6. Those who take and play knight before, you play bishop c4, and you always kick this knight away with a3. Uh, I always want to play, uh, get a pawn back on d4. I'm threatening d6, so you have to play d6. Then I'll take, play knight d4, and I want to play c4, b4, queen d3. Great game. Uh, I don't see why would uh, somebody like to play a game like this with a black piece. That's why after a bishop f4, they almost exclusively go with d6. You take knight e4. Lots of guys in the past, of course, they have to play castles. Lots of guys in the past played knight takes e4. Well, if you're willing to take risk, let it be. Knight b5, I'm threatening knight c7. Knight bc7, rook b8, and bishop d3. Knight f6 and just castles. I broke your pawn structure. I'm not even down a pawn and I started to play this opening uh, with almost uh, sacrificing two pawns and I'm happy. Uh, I'm better. D6 is clearly weak pawn. And uh, finally, if uh, my student, uh, she's a woman I am, uh, she told me that she lost a game with a black pieces once. She captured everything and got into uh, a worse position. So castles, castles, knight d5, and e takes d5, bishop f6, and queen d2. And she also told me that she suffered like lots of problems on the king side, uh, mainly because of the dark square bishop. And yes, the dark square bishop here is kind of, um, even though it looks good at the moment, it's kind of misplaced. Let me show you. Your plan is very simple. It's like an English attack against Sicilian, against Philly, they're open and many other uh, periods opening and others. You just start pushing your pawns. So, bishop f5, f3. I want to do g4, h4. You go h6 to save, uh, to keep a shelter for your bishop. No big deal, man. g4. I put my king in safety, so you can't play bishop g5 just like that. And when you play rook e8, they play h4. Uh, funniest thing about this one is they can't take on h4 again because of bishop h6. And if they play bishop e5, like I want to desperately uh, somehow get rid of this bishop, you play bishop e3. Here I found the analysis uh, queen e7 with the idea of surprising bishop c3 because they want to break your pawn structure and get this pawn. If they get this pawn, we don't have attack anymore. Once again, no big deal. We play g5. They play bishop c3, I take. They take, I play bishop d3. You know what? I consider myself being better here. Why? I, I already have an attack. I'm threatening bishop h7. I want to play g takes h6. I want to put my rook open on the g file. White is simply better. And let me just show you the best line here for black after bishop f4, d6, knight e4. Once again, we threaten knight b5. They got to go castles. We play knight b5. Uh, I like this idea uh, also, probably the most of all these variations. I just want to remind all of you guys who are just fans of uh, positions against the open uh, filader, you can bring the knight back and go with knight c3. It is not going to give you like the best uh, opportunity and possibility to play uh, like open filader positions because you'll be down a tempi, but it's still fine. It, at least it's unclear. You just do bishop e2 castle short or queen d2 castle long and do the pawn storm on the king's side. So when you play knight b5, uh, they have to take and play knight e5. And here one has uh, basically two different options. 
to play long castle with a typical ideas, whereas white pushes pawns on the king's side. And another plan could be short castle, where white just has more solid but also more difficult task if wants to carry on with initiative. Uh, I would go with queen d2. Uh, by the way, absolutely, bishop e2, c3 to soften up this bishop. Castle and knight a3, which is the most important thing here, not knight e4 because of bishop e4, but knight a3 uh, because you want to remove this knight via c2 to e3 and then go with bishop g3 and f4. It's interesting, but I prefer queen d2, a6, knight e4, bishop d7, and long castles. And you know what? I want to put my king in a safety, king b1. I would like to play bishop g3 and kick that knight away with f4. Um, I eventually can always think of. Uh, doing the pawn storm and pushing these pawns on the king's side. Hope you enjoy it. And this presentation of um, uh, my uh, one of my favorites, uh, E4A5 systems, Belgrade Gambit for White. Uh, hope you're going to support us more and uh, definitely keep giving your suggestions. But of course, uh, be patient because it takes time to make all these videos. All the best, guys. Bye-bye.